Amen. Happy Mother's Day, all you mothers. And I meant that sincerely. I didn't even get a chuckle. That's awesome. So this is the last of the Chosen series. And uh, when Pat said it, I actually kind of had a little tear come down. I've appreciated the gathering on Sunday nights. It, it was just has been a really sweet spirit and uh, uh, great interaction. It was wonderful. I'm prayerful about what God might have us to aim at beyond there, but we'll see what happens next. Um, so last week, I was talking about the sheep and the goats, and Jesus specifically says that he is coming again. There will be a return, that he will come back, and all things will be made right. All of these places in the world where there's um, disjointedness, um, brokenness, um, def- defect, meaning like it's not the way it's supposed to be. And most of us have this in- innate sense that something's wrong. It's Even in our best days, there's just something that seems a little off or dissident. When Jesus returns, all of these things will be reconciled. All things will be made new. And that's the coming promise. And that's what I kind of focused on last week. And then he said this. Um, the f- th- this is what we're supposed to do while we're waiting. So one, he says he's coming, and we're not supposed to doubt, no matter how weird the world gets, and the world, world gets weird. But while we're waiting, we're supposed to feed the hungry. We're supposed to be sheltering the homeless, clothing, clothing the naked, and then visiting the sick and those in prison. He gives us some very specific things to do while we are waiting for this time where he said he would return. And oftentimes, like in The Chosen, the disciples get confused and start to bicker, and it's a wonderful experience because it seems like the real world. It's kind of fun. So this week, um, it's a culmination. They've been working towards this Sermon on the Mount, uh, this major manifesto that Jesus is going to be presenting. And I'm gonna, I chose this section where Jesus and Matthew are talking about that preparation. So if we could watch that. Matthew, look. Mary finished the notices. They're leaving to spread the word. I hope they can find a way to work together. What do you mean? They can't seem to agree on a single thing lately. Myself included sometimes. Oh, I've noticed. In some ways, it's to be expected. But not desired, surely. No, no. But it's what's bound to happen when you start something that's open to all, truly, all people. Zealots, even tax collectors. People who have been through tough times. People both hesitant and skeptical, as well as bold and confident. People hungry to learn, as well as those learned and knowledgeable. Let's get back to work. How many sections are we up to? 19. Here's a little incomplete, huh? There is something about 20 that is more symmetrical. You could always shorten it to 18. Brevity is usually preferred. Which section stands out to you the most? Do not be anxious about your life, of course. Are there any sections that concern you? Give me your honest opinion. I know I don't have to say that, but... The whole truth. You know I won't be offended. It's... well... very striking. But if I do the math in terms of good news and bad, it seems like there's not a lot of good news. Anyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery. Doesn't that make everyone an adulterer? If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. Wouldn't that lead to an entire population of people walking around with only one eye? Oh, and this one. If anyone were to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. Mm. Trees that bear bad fruit being cut down and torn into the fire. The gate is narrow and hard that leads to life. 
depart from me, I never knew you? Do you realize how heavily laden your sermon is with these kinds of ominous pronouncements? I haven't even named half of them. It's a manifesto, Matthew. I'm not here to be sentimental and soothing. I'm here to start a revolution. Well, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That isn't exactly... I said revolution, not revolt. I'm talking about a radical shift. Did you think I was just going to come here and say, hey, everyone, just uh, keep doing what you've been doing for the last thousand years since it's been going so great? Also, there's the beginning and the end. What about the beginning? My concern about the beginning is more logistical. Right now, your opening line is, you are the salt of the earth. I'm worried, particularly if it is windy, or if the crowd is larger than we expect, that people near the back will hear, salt the earth, and it will immediately call to mind a negative connotation. The Punic Wars? Yes. When Rome destroyed Carthage, they sowed the city with salt to make it barren and to curse anyone who would rebuild upon it. I share your concern about the opening line, but for different reasons. I think the sermon needs some sort of introduction, an invitation into what, as you have rightly pointed out, will be a complex and at times challenging set of teachings. What does you are the salt of the earth even mean? I'm not good at metaphor. Salt preserves meat from corruption. It slows its decay. I want my followers to be a people who hold back the evil of the world. Salt also enhances the flavor of things. I want my followers to renew the world and be part of its redemption. Salt can also be mixed with honey and rubbed on the skin for maladies. I want my people to participate in the healing of the world, not its destruction. Then why not just say that? <laughs> Come on, Matthew. Allow me a little poetry, huh? Not everyone is like you. Some people like a little flavor. Read the songs of David or, or Solomon. I'm not going nearly as far with metaphor as Solomon. I'm reading him next. Well, good luck. He's probably... <laughs> yeah. I told you. These things will make sense to some, but not to others. I don't want passive followers. Those who are truly committed will peer deeply into it, looking for truth. But I do agree with you. We shouldn't begin with salt. You make a valid point. Good work. I love The Chosen. Uh, can I get user agreement? So I got the privilege of riding for four hours in a car with my daughter, and so she got the privilege of listening to me talk about what we were, <laughs> what we were talking about. And uh, I was looking for an illustration that would speak to everybody about uh, Christianity, I guess, and this idea of um, what does it mean? What are we agreeing to? And she said, well, well think about like your Facebook user agreement. It's updated regularly, and most of us, unless you're like Matthew, just go scroll down to the bottom and click, I agree. I don't know if you're like that, and I'm just confessing, and it's probably not the smartest thing I've ever done, but that's the way it is. And I think, uh, for most Christians, the Bible is, a like, is like a software license. Nobody actually reads it, and you just scroll down to the bottom and click, I agree. Like, and with that, I was thinking about this text specifically and all that Jesus is talking about. So Hebrews 4.12 says, and, and this was prompted by when Jesus says, I don't want passive followers. He wants people who look deeply into his word and search for him. Again, his word is alive and active. It, it's a living document. It's something that you could look at this morning, and then if you look at the exact same text, something else will speak or show up differently. And it's because we're not uh, static, and the Bible is not static. And so w as we change throughout the day, the Bible also seems to change either with us or for us. It's an interesting thing. So again, he's looking for active 
and pass or not passive followers. It's also sharper than a two-edged sword, dividing spirit and soul. This idea that there are multiple spirits in the world. There's not just one or two. There's multiple spirits. But there's one spirit of the living God. One. And that one spirit is articulated throughout Scripture. It's our, it's our centering point. It's our... our uh, <laughs> A grounding peace. As much as you know, we're being taught to ground ourselves in the ground, you know, in the real world when we're panicked or or stressed or pressed, we're also supposed to ground ourselves with what scripture says about us. And then there's this third component, the Holy Spirit, which then interprets this the, the living word for us and leads us into all truth. This is the way when the world gets wild and wacky, which, which it does for me. I don't know if it does for you. This is the process. In the real world, feet on the ground in real life, but also connected, abiding, uh, focused attention on Scripture, and God, through the Spirit, would lead and guide us. And then we become these conduits for what I think he's looking for. He is here to start a revolution, not a revolt. This is not the overthrow of the government through violence. This is not what he's after. He says it specifically here. It's also specific in Scripture. A revolution. Well, what's the difference? And again, it's the spirit in which it is done. Can I get insanity? Again, I, we had a great laugh here. He says, did you really think I was going to say, keep doing what you've been doing for the last thousand years because it's going so well for you? Again, I think of Ed, our friend Ed. He always says, well, how is that working out? And every time we kick him under the table, at least some of us do. But there's this, the reality of doing the exact same thing and expecting a different result. It's, it is so habitual to us and to me. And it's also why we're calling the community together on Wednesday. We have aimed and we have hit at what we're looking at, but I believe God wants us to do something that is more fruitful than just the same old things, expecting a different result. Manifesto. Again, a public declaration, usually of a prince or sovereign, claiming large powers and showing his intention. I, again, it speaks specifically to what uh, the words, the, the language they're using. This is this document of revolution. This is the document that will flip the world back right side up. This is the document that speaks of Jesus' intention and his desire for us to be those instruments or conduits of his kingdom. In scripture, if you look, Matthew, again, coincidentally, the, the guy that we're looking at and the guy we like, it's chapters 5, 6, and 7. It would take us three months probably to go through. So I'm challenging you to look at it based on what we're talking about to see what he is trying to say. The other thing is... Um, Again, he just commended Matthew for saying we should put in some sort of introduction. So all we're going to look at today is Matthew 5, 1 through 12. I'm going to pray and then just catch my breath. Father God, we just thank you for being here with us. And I thank you for each and every mom that is here and, and the promise of each of the kids that these moms represent and us as those kids of our mothers. I pray for this message, for your spirit to speak to us and to lead us and guide us into all truth, and that you would show us, speak to us, inspire us, guide and direct us as you would have us to go. God, I pray all of this in your name. Amen. One day, as he saw the crowds gathering, Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples gathered around him, and he began to teach them. God blesses those who are poor 
and realizes their need for him. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice. They will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when, you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad for a great re reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. User-friendly agreement or or user agreement okay so I, on the outside i've got my two lovely and talented assistants who on the way out if you if this speaks to you and you want a more durable copy i've got some on cardstock which are available i was looking at one per household in my imagination this is going up on my mirror so that um, while i'm getting ready i can remind myself of this manifesto and what it it means to me Although the purpose of the Beatitudes, this is what they're calling this section of the text, was to declare the blessings given by God's kingdom, most scholars also re regard them as a painting of a picture of the character of the kingdom of heaven. The characteristics, but with characteristics, it's this embodiment, the character of the individuals within the kingdom. This is like, again, we're oftentimes we're trying to fix the outside of things where God is always, I believe, calling us to fix the inside of us first. And so if you look at the kingdom of heaven and these beatitudes as an inside out process, this is where I'm asking you to think about it, so as we grow into God's kingdom, we hope to become more like those named as blessed. We want to become more meek, more merciful, more hungry for righteousness, more apt to integrate or to make peace, and so on. This gives us, these Beatitudes, a moral directive and then later when Jesus says, make disciples of all nations, the Beatitudes describe the character of these, or the characteristics of these characters. So poor in spirit. There are some people who know, we talked about this yesterday morning at breakfast, that, that they need help, that they are powerless, that there's, uh, there's God, and then there's us. There's this distinctive. And more times or than not, when I get into trouble, I start to think, okay, God and I are kind of like this. You know, I'm pretty good at what I want to do. And I know this. I'm capable at accomplishing something. And so I start to get a little full of myself and a little less of God. And then I start to control or manipulate or make things happen. And it's not that you can't make things happen. I think this is what's difficult for us is I, I'm looking around this room and several people I know can really make things happen. They're very capable people. And the challenge is when we get a little too full of ourselves and a little less full of the Spirit of God, then we start making up our own kingdom and not this kingdom of heaven. And so the requirement 
for this kind of kingdom is this recognition that I am not the one. I'm not the one who makes it happen. I'm not the one who decides what's up and down, right and wrong, good or bad. I am not the one. And neither are you. Uh, this morning, we were talking about basketball. Again, it may not be your sport, may not be interesting to you. But there are some players. We grew up with Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson. There were characters, um, players, who literally could make things happen. And not only that, but they made everybody better. They, they just elevated the play of everyone who was on the court with them. And I was thinking about that this morning, that... Here, our central player isn't me. It's not Dan, Brian, Tammy, Amanda, Andrea. It's none of you. It has to be Jesus Christ. Everything that we do, everything that we center our focus, our attention on, has to come from him. And if you're looking at me to be the next Michael Jordan... It's already been established and ain't going to happen. You know, again, a little bit on the, the south side of this, this hill. But we also know that not by power, not by might, but through his spirit are these things done. And as I said in the letter, unless the Lord builds a house, all of the labor, all of the effort is in vain. Blessed are those who mourn. Again, I was thinking about Jesus and his entrance into Jerusalem where he, was, he knew that people were missing him. That because they missed him, all hell was literally going to break loose. The entire city was going to be destroyed and he wept because he knew what was going to happen next. I think about Lazarus, his friend who dies. And this is Jesus. This is, uh, he could raise him from the dead. He must have known it was going to happen. But he still wept because Lazarus ex experienced death. I love the chosen and the way they predict or present Jesus because he seems so caring. And he's not okay when people act inappropriately or when they get scared or they get broken and he goes about his business of trying and, and uh, following his, God, his father to do only what his father led him to do into this reconciliation of putting things back the way it was intended. When you grieve, Lily is a great example. We were talked about it last week. It reveals our hearts. This is not the way it's supposed to be. God forbid. And there are other lesser dramatic things that are happening every day that still should break our hearts. Any loss, all loss, needs to be grieved and mourned. The meek. Blessed are the meek, not the weak. Jesus was not weak. It wasn't that he was incapable of overthrowing Rome. It wasn't as though he was incapable of resisting arrest. He allowed it to happen. He had all power and submitted and surrendered himself. Bullies are weak because they use their power without thought or restraint. The meek are those extraordinarily capable who could easily dismiss or thump you, but they don't. The meek, the turn the other cheek Jesus, I had this revelation as I was preparing for this that I am super competitive. Most of you, if you know me a while, you know that about me. I'm getting older. But I realized that I needed to win. 
Uh, I could think of last year where we were playing uh, spike ball against younger people. I needed to win. Like for myself, for my self-esteem. And I felt better when I crushed a younger person. Honest, I'm confessing. This is, this is bullying. This is not meekness. And it's revealing my heart. The kingdom of heaven will be full of meek individuals, extraordinarily capable, but without that self-soothing need to prove how strong they are. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. In ancient Judaism, righteousness meant to acquit, vindicate, restore into a right relationship. The righteous are those who maintain right relationships with God and each other. This is our craving. Again, my experience, when I'm having, and I have these, these kind of rift troubles, it's because I'm not doing this job well. If I'm not in right relationship, I cannot be in right relationship. And for those of us who hunger and thirst for right relating, this is a part of the new kingdom. We submit ourselves up. We look for what God would have us to do. We listen through the Spirit and are empowered to act on it. And that's what makes for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. If you are blessed with sorrow for your own failings, the second beatitude, and with right relationships, the fourth, you will not find it difficult to show mercies to other anywhere else in life. If, if you're aware of your own tendencies to fall, and you're maintaining this right relationship, you're going to, forgiveness will be this natural counterpart because there but by the grace of God go I, I would be exactly in the same place, and so it's easier for me to forgive. Mercy consists of treating people better than they deserve from us because we have been treated better. I'm going to say that more clearly. Because we have been treated better by God than we deserve. That's better. Pure-hearted. Again, it's like Matthew. If you, if, if you look at a woman with a lust, you know, pluck out your eye. You know, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Only pure-hearted can be with God. I'm out. I, I can't make it. Psalm 24, 3 through 6. This is out of the message, says, Who can climb Mount God? Who can scale the holy north face? Only the clean-handed and the pure of heart. Men who won't cheat and women who won't seduce. God is at their side, and with God's help, they make it. This, Jacob, is what happens to God-seekers and God-questers. I think what they're saying is purity of heart arises not from perfection of our will. That's not where it comes from. But the reception of God's grace. It isn't about our ability to be pure. It's our ability to receive this undeserved grace. Peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. Again, there's this. This is the easy, I say easy, because it's, it's within my control. 
but peacemakers are when I can go to someone who has offended me or I have offended, and I realize I've done it, and I go, I'm so sorry. And then they receive what I'm offering. This is integration. This is reconciliation. This is reweaving. It's more than just not punching people. It's about making amends. Amends. Reweaving, reintegrating, working it out. Our God is the God of peace. That's 1 Thessalonians 5. And we show ourselves to be his children when we seek to make peace in the workplace, in community, in our homes, and in the whole world. Again, I... Uh, my life is a mess. You, you will say, you know, you're exaggerating. No, you don't understand. Like most of you know, I came from a pretty wicked, despicable life, and I have older kids, and I have grandkids, and Izzy and I were driving uh, right past one of my older kids' house. And in that house were some grandkids that I've never seen. And the brokenness is real. It is not pretend. I'm not telling you this to elevate myself or to um, manipulate. Just telling you the way it is. And when I look at these things and I'm like, peace, I'm in pieces. How can I offer peace? How can I untangle what seems to be so twisted. And the point is, I can't. I can't. But we know who can. And this piece I'm talking about is be at peace as much as it's up to you. And in this kingdom, we, we don't manipulate, we don't force, we invite, we make bridges, we extend our hands. But when they're not received, that's on other people and not on us. Again, another edism. Persecuted. Blessed are the persecuted. A blessing that is active persecution for the right reasons. It's when the powers of darkness sees you doing something beautiful and comes against you. It's when you want to do good. You want to make amends. You want to repair what is broken. You want to tell somebody about the chosen or Jesus specifically. And you're mocked and ridiculed or rebuffed. That's what we're talking about. In other countries, it's where if you say, I f follow Jesus, you could be killed. Our uh, sensitivity to our persecution is real. I'm not trying to diminish it. But I also want you to know it's like weightlifting. meaning the more you stand for what is right and pure and noble and praiseworthy, the more bold you are about Jesus, the harder the persecution will come. And what happens when you increase your weight and your lifting? You get stronger. Love looks like something. Can I get that? <laughs> Just yesterday, uh, I felt very affirmed. We were talking about what does it look like for the kingdom of heaven 
to manifest itself, to, to, for these ideas to be put into a person, to, to actually be embodied, like to take on flesh, to, to take the idea and then think through your behavior and what would it look like to be like this? And it looks like love. And not like I love Coke or pizza, but it looks like I love Jesus. The kingdom of heaven looks way different than the world looks. And you're like, have you looked around? The kingdom of heaven looks different than the world looks. It does. You can see it. When you see it, you know it. It's in this world, real people making right relationships with God and others and things within the world. Real people making right relationships, first with God, then with people, and then with the stuff and things. Everything in order. Again, the attempt, the ideal is what I'm talking about. In this world, not of the world. What that means to me is we don't use the same tools. Again, uh, we were talking about manipulation earlier this morning. I don't think God manipulates. I don't think it's a device in heaven. I really don't. Just an example. Violence. Threats. Lying. Bless you. <laughs> In this real world, but not of it, we don't use the same tools. No weapon formed against us can prevail. Not using the same value structures and not using wrong relationships. Wrong relationship this way, again, me, God. Not wrong relationships this way. Me above you. Or you above me. I'm going to go back to a video and then we'll come back. I come bearing apricots. Ah, it's a good day today. <laughs> Um, uh, ah. Shalom, Thomas. <sighs> ah, these are the lights. Shalom. Shalom. Having mine under the tent. Is Rema coming out? Uh, no, I don't think so. She's pretty intent on studying. Oh. Mary is writing leaflet notices and invitations and. Sometimes crying. She went through something bad. I think she just needs time. Mm. And what about them? In the most generous explanation, I'd call that love. <laughs> that does not look like love to me. <laughs> no, they all love our rabbi and want to follow him the right way. They just can't agree on what that right way is. I get the blank screen. Conflict. Jesus said it's, it's inevitable. It's going to happen. Because some people, really educated and, and super smart, and others super passionate, and some know, and some don't know anything. And it's open to everybody. And so the conflict is depicting love. It's, it's 
that you still care. I used to think love and hate were like so opposite, but it's the same end, it's a stick. Like, so this, um, I could say my ex-wife, I, I love her, and at points I hated her. I cared deeply about her. I cared deeply. And the disciples all loved Jesus. But they were coming from such a diverse pile of people. And so conflict is inevitable. It's required. It's apathy that is our enemy. And worse than apathy, contempt. That's our enemy. If you're passionate, the Spirit of God is in you. That's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. The blank image. I want you to imagine what needs to change in you in context of this. What is God stirring in you? If you're like me, I'm like, well, there's some of these I'm not so bad at, and then there's these other ones like hulky smokes. I, I don't even deserve to be in this. And it's unique. It's not like a cookie cutter. It's, it's really very beautiful. What needs to change in you? And then in our community, what needs to change for us? I think I need to be a little bit uh, thicker skinned uh, for conflict, oftentimes I think that conflict is just evidence that I'm doing it wrong because it's a voice I hear all the time. But what if it's actually the opposite? What if God's gathering a group of really passionate people who just want to love Jesus and they're coming from all kinds of different places? If you want, I've got 16 of the hard copies. You're welcome. We'd li I'd like to give them out if you want them. If you don't want them, I, I will use them. Um, that's for you on the way out. Moms, uh, there's a rose for you. Uh, it is the smallest of tokens that I could come up with that would even... <sighs> represent the feelings I have for you guys. It's going to decay, and it's going to rot. But our relationship in eternity, hopefully I'll get a chance to make up for it. Um, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to go to one last song. Father God, I, I lift up our community in context of this manifesto, in that we wouldn't just click, I agree, <laughs> but that we would actually grapple with you. We've got three chapters, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, that are really tough. And I think this whole year, if we really wrestle with it, it you will change us in this process. Our God in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us every time we fall short. <laughs> and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from these evil things. 
Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. And God, to you, all of the glory. And I pray all this in your name. Amen. One last song.